thank you for the introduction. Um, the, I, I tried to put a lot of S's into this talk, SoundCloud story of seeking sustainable SRE. There's even one S at the end, I guess, but um, we should probably talk first where all those words are coming from. Um, so let's just go through them and let's start at the end. SRE is the word that I guess you all know because it's in the name of this conference, but um, we should not forget that it started as something quite clandestine, like Google internally used this um, and nobody knew what it is. And I started at Google in like 12 years ago or something, even more. And like I could tell my friends, even my tech friends, I'm an SRE at Google and they ask, what? And like the smarter of them, they thought I'm like taking care of the air condition in the office. There's actually SRE.org. You can go to that website and you might understand where this is coming from. But of course, I'm talking about a different kind of SRE and this is by now codified canonically in a book. I sometimes call it the holy scripture, but yeah. I shouldn't do that, whatever, like it's, um, um, everybody can read about it. Um, I was there before there was a book, so I kind of could do SRE by the book before there was a book, which at Google is kind of the obvious thing, but then I changed companies five years ago and joined SoundCloud. Um, now this is a very different company. Um, I hope you know our product. It's about music, music streaming. Sadly, I cannot talk about music. It would be quite uh, enjoyable, I guess, but um, this is just about technical backgrounds. Um, I think the only important point here is that the music stream market is really tough. Like you are driven by innovation and tough competition and everything. Uh, a few numbers, this is all not official. It's just super ballpark, order of magnitude style. We have about 100 million users, like as an order of magnitude might be twice or three times or whatever as many. Just that you get the idea, so I guess for a startup, I mean we are 10 years old now, or 11, but I still count as a startup and I guess it's fairly successful if you have that many users. But we have only about 100 engineers, which uh, sometimes friends ask me, why do you have 100 engineers for an MP3 upload site? And this is actually not a lot. Like if you look at our most obvious competitor, Spotify, they have like I don't know, 2,000 engineers or something. Again, like I don't know the exact number. But the most important part is this inequality at the bottom. Um, we have a lot of moving parts, a lot of features we have to serve. And I mean, what is a service? What is a feature? Um, it's just like very broadly, I would claim we have more services than engineers. Now, this is something that many startups, uh, I think they are in the same situation. They have not many people. They are successful. They have this hockey stick growth of users. And if they are not one of those like single feature startups, which also legitimately exists, but you are one of those, yeah, we have like many different groups of users, then you're in that situation. I think SoundCloud is a rather extreme example, but that also renders it a very good example to learn from. Um, like SoundCloud has those user groups, like we have uploaders, musicians who upload music, we have listeners, we have rights holders, we have advertisers, all those people, and they all need a bunch of services. Now let's not compare this to other startups, but to this one, right? This is the inventor of SRE, so it's kind of relevant. Also previous employer and representative for a very large internet company. They have the world as users, so I put a billion here um, as order of magnitude. Um, and they have a humongous amount of engineers 10,000 order of magnitude. And of course, they also serve many more features than SoundCloud, but I would claim that safely, I would claim that they have uh, more engineers than services. And that inequality is actually quite important. All those uh, change in scale um, is important. Um, when I joined, when I went from the right side to the left side, there were two interesting observations. The one was, this company has a severe problem with the reliability of their site. Okay, perhaps common thing, right? Um, but the other interesting observation was, oh my gosh, there are all my colleagues. Like we have a handful of ex-Google SREs, some of them are in the room, <laughs> that uh, work for that company. And there's this obvious match, like, okay, there are SREs, they're like those magic people who have magic G1s, and they can wave their wand and make the site reliable by applying their magic tricks they learned in the enchanted castle that is Google. Sure, um, no, it didn't work. Um, 
That's where the seeking is coming from and this failing at SRE before it was cool. Because like, I mean, this was, SRE was still a thing that people talked about and some people tried, but there was no book. But we could do it by the book, but it didn't work. Um, and now everybody could do it by the book because there's a book and it won't work, unless you're Google. Um, this reminds me of the keynote, John and Corey had this, right, where they said you could just take this culture deck from Netflix and apply it and then, no, it won't work because you're not Netflix. Uh, like there are many things culture-wise that have to match what you're doing. Um, and also, this was the previous slide, scale-wise. And the seeking is coming from there. I mean, you still want a reliable site, right? You want to seek site reliability, but you might need to do it in a different way. And the whole idea in this talk is there are some parts of SRE that are fundamental laws, like fundamental laws of physics. You build some machine, you do something in the real world, laws of physics will always apply whatever you do. Um, and there are laws of site reliability that always apply, uh, but there are also like things, how you build a machine, the details might vary a lot, and by like finding out which parts are fundamental laws I cannot circumvent and which parts are things where I can do my own thing and find my own way. That's the seeking part. Now this is a story and I would totally like to have like a little fireplace here and a rocking chair and tell you the story in all detail. It would take three or four hours but we only have like 25 minutes. Um, so if you can't tell the whole story, you write it down in a book. And I think some people talked about that. We even had a, a boff yesterday about that. Um, David, is the, who is also at this conference, he's the editor of a really interesting book. I mean, this is totally not a pitch for the book, of course, but you should still read it. <laughs> and one chapter in this book is our story. Like Matthias, a colleague of mine, and I, we wrote down that story of Seeking SRE, and you also see where the Seeking is coming from, stolen from the book title. Um, yeah. Now, this talk cannot just, I cannot just read out the chapter, that would take too long, but I can use this talk to focus on something and also look at things from a different perspective. Take another lens, looking through it, and that lens was provided to me by the uh, call for papers for this conference. And um, Vanessa talked about this this morning, right? There, and you might have noticed, there's a theme at this conference, which is sustain sustainable reliability engineering. It's also an S, but yeah. So sustainable. And then in the CFP, they talked about technical depth and dark depth and operational overload and individual burnout. And I thought, yes, that's totally us, right? So like over the last five years, SoundCloud was haunted by that. Uh, we do those engineering retrospectives with post-its. And whatever came up there as one of the top three pain points was technical depth. We were drowning in technical depth. Uh, also, dark depth is the one you don't recognize. Vanessa explained that quite nicely. Um, we'll mention that later a bit, in a bit more detail. Um, now, I like the depth metaphor because it really makes sense. And it also tells you that this is not something you have to avoid at all costs. If you do, if you take a loan in a controlled fashion, that's something that helps you, right? If you buy a house, you take a loan, you pay it back. If you're a startup, you take like venture capital and the investors hope that they will get a return of investment. So if you are on a tough market, you really have to launch that feature. You, in an informed fashion, you launch that features in a quick and dirty way and later you will fix it up, right? Okay, I mean, often this gets out of control, like your debt might spiral out of control. And um, how do you recognize that? How you find the right trade-off? This is a thing that is kind of orthogonal to SRE because it could affect your site reliability. It could also affect your ability to launch new features or something. So arguably different concept has some intersection with SRE. Um, and here, of course, SRECon will focus on SRE. And um, we might even um, focus on something, on one single aspect of it. Um, like you have this SRE toolkit, enormous amount of tools, and you can use them to balance tech depth as well as getting your site reliability under control. And I, again, want to focus on one thing, which is error budgets, simply because it's quite well known what it is. Um, this whole like solution to this eternal struggle between devs who always want to push new features and ops who want to keep that presumably more stable system running. 
And then you have those error budgets, you agree. If you blow your error budget, you're not going to push new features. So it, this sounds like a great thing, and it's at the core of SRE, and it's also a really nice example to illustrate what challenges we had in our SoundCloud situation, which might be similar to your situation. Um, so it sounds very easy to have that, very obvious if you have read about it in the original SRE book, which you should read if you haven't yet. Um, but there are prerequisites, monitoring, management support, and always that nuclear option of returning the pager. Let's talk a bit more detail about it. Monitoring is the obvious part. If you don't measure your errors, how can you know that your error budget is blown? On the other side, monitoring is something that many companies um, didn't do or they forgot about it. They started small, they didn't need it, and then they grew bigger and bigger and had this as an afterthought, and they got into the habit of having monitoring as the eternal afterthought, or like, yeah, you always put it there somewhere, or you ask the ops people to do it when the software has been launched or something. Okay, that's five years ago, dark age of monitoring. Hashtag monitoring sucks was this thing. SoundCloud was totally uh, affected by that. We also had this like, top of the pack technology thing, like we did containers before there was Docker, we did container orchestration before there was Kubernetes or Mesos or something. I mean, this was all long after Google, of course, but we used those technologies that were pretty new in like normal companies and monitoring, yeah, nobody thought about this initially, but then we had those SREs there and they realized, okay, we need that, right? And I mean, there's this whole story of Prometheus and all those things that, um, yeah, different story, but this has to do with monitoring. You really need monitoring. And this is also an example for a fundamental law of SRE. Uh, you cannot even think about site reliability, no matter which way you implement it, if you don't have monitoring. And there's this, not by accident that in Mikey Dickerson's famous hierarchy of service reliability, it's right at the bottom. Monitoring is the base of everything else. And this hierarchy is, is my fav favorite illustration from the SRE book. This is so nice because you, you will climb up this hierarchy if you do site reliability, even if you don't know that it exists. And if you read the story in the SRE book, Google didn't know this exists. This was made up by Mikey when he left Google and explained things to people outside of Google. Really intriguing story. Um, you can listen to Mikey's talks or you can Read it up in the blue book. Monitoring is the base for everything, essentially. Ah, by the way, um, I mean, nowadays we have a way better uh, awareness and we have way better tools. Um, so monitoring is pretty good by now, um, but there's also this whole discussion about observability. And I think this is a good discussion because people say, yeah, there was monitoring, but that's not sufficient. We need observability. My footnote there is when I said monitoring ever, I was always having this holistic perspective, very inclusive, and I think what people now mean if they say observability, this is exactly what I meant when I said monitoring five years ago. And I'm pretty sure Mikey meant that as well, and he, if he did this today, he would probably have written observability, or because he's Mikey and he's password resistant, he would just have written monitoring anyway. Um, yeah, right. Um, next point, management support. A bit less obvious um, because error budget seems so self-regulating, so you don't need any manager anymore managing you. But first of all, you need to put this framework into place in the first place. You need buy-in from everybody. And that means not only that your management buys in, but that your management is capable to make everybody else buy in. And if you actually blow your error budget, you need to have the discipline to stop launch features and work on your tech debt or your reliability. Um, and it's surprising if you're in a tough market situation how often you will realize, okay, um, this one feature I would not launch now is actually the one that's so important to keep us in the market that we will launch it anyway, and you will always find that excuse. So it's again, is it even for you if you're in a tough market situation, and if yes, are you like disciplined enough? Whatever, at Google, in my opinion, they have very, very strong management in many aspects. You could even say authoritarian management, and I don't mean this in this blunt way of like they are pushing top-down really bad decisions. They're 
I mean, in a positive way, they are capable of making 20,000 engineers align behind a certain decision. Hopefully good, sometimes bad, but whatever. They have this capability, and this is, you can't take that for granted. And you cannot just create that ability because that would probably, like, I don't know, do some weird things with your company culture. Now, many things, if I talk about management support, many, many people ask me after talks like that, so how do we do this? Like, we go back from this conference and we tell my, I tell my bosses about ESRI and DevOps and all those things, and they, my bosses say, okay, yeah, but we did it differently all the time, and I mean, they are kind of generally change averse. You might have this problem, and I don't have good advice from my own experience because SoundCloud didn't have this problem. Our management was, Yes, sure, we tried this out. Like, innovation, experiments, it's all great. This is a good part. The bad part is if you have this, like, anything goes mentality, it's really hard to align the company behind a common thing, like error budgets. Like, we had many teams that would say, yeah, we are doing it our way. We are like a microservice company, and we can independently in every team autonomously do whatever we think it's best has good parts, has bad parts. Like, if you rely on something or everybody has to obey, might be problematic. But again, your culture, you need to embrace it. This is the cultural dimension of how to implement things. Ideally, you evolve your culture, but you don't, like, throw it out of, out of, of the window or you do something that matches your culture. We'll talk about that in a minute. Finally, nuclear option, SREs, at Google, they are seen as, a, like, having SRE support is seen as a huge privilege for developers, and the mundane reason for this is that the SREs will take the pages, and the devs are happy they're not on call anymore. Great. Um, in turn, that means if SRE thinks developers don't play to their rules, they can say, okay, you can do that, but here's the pager. We are not supporting you anymore. This is called the nuclear option because it's usually just a threat. So you can say that, and then you will agree on doing this or that. Um, however, I've seen that in my career that the pager was returned to developers and it didn't feel nice, but ultimately was helpful. So, I mean, there is this, this is how it works. Um, now, at SoundCloud, we can't do that. And the reason is not that we are too nice and we would never do that and to our, I mean, we are really nice and perhaps we don't like nuclear options and threats and something, but that's not the reason why we can't do this. The reason is that the one team that most closely resembles SRE, which is my team, production engineering, we don't carry the pager for the developers. So we can't return it. And we can't tell them to do things what we think they should do. Um, so this is a bit weird, right? So why, why is that happening? And there is something, this is now again about the scale thing that forces you to do this. And this is again fundamental law territory. Because the SRE book gives you numbers. They give you concrete numbers. How large should be your on-call rotation? And if you have multiple teams that follow the sun, it should be at least six people, and it should be eight otherwise, and that has many reasons, work-life balance, this famous less than 50% ops work thing. So if you have only one team, one SRE team, it has to be at least eight people. Um, there it is, right? So now what's the percentage of engineers you can put into your SRE org in contrast to like actually develop your product? 5%, 10%, I don't know what the official number is at Google or Facebook, but remember we have about 100 engineers, so one team is 8%, two teams would only be 16%, so it's kind of obvious that we can only afford to have one SRE team at SoundCloud. Now many of you might not be able to afford a single one. In the BOF session yesterday we had exactly that question, like we have six backend engineers, how do we do SRE, right? Similar, similar thing. Um, I mean, we, at least we have that privilege. We can have one SRE team, but that one SRE team, if it has the pager for the developers, it would be on call for everything, which means a lot in a company like SoundCloud. And that, again, violates fundamental laws of SRE. The one thing is that you must never have more than 50% ops work. For various reasons, it's all explained in the book. Um, but, like, if you get the pages for the whole company and you have like this diversity of services is a source of toil. It's very difficult to automate if you have this heterogeneous environment. You might ask why do we have a heterogeneous environment in the first place, but yeah, autonomous teams, whatever. Um, also like if every system would be in a very mature state but you have just a lot of them and very different ones, statistically you get a lot of pages but of course as a startup your systems are not very mature. And 
are a bit pager prone anyway. So you get paged all the time and you cannot do more than 50% non-ops work. And the other thing is um, a common misunderstanding of SRE. Like I told you my problems of explaining to people what SRE is, and one of my colleagues had this explanation, yeah, my job is I take the page from the page and bring it to the developer who causes it. Um, no, right, this is not SRE, this is a devolution of SRE. SREs, to be SREs, in the proper sense, have to react to pages in a competent way. But now if you're on call for a million different systems and no single human being can know all of them, you will have struggled to react in a competent way. Bleak situation. So how could we solve that? Like we, we have this, we could have this one SRE team, but they couldn't take the picture for everybody. Solution, again, depends on your situation, your scale, your culture. Our solution in the end, after many iterations was, make everybody an SRE, at least part-time. Um, sounds good, but um, it, concretely, this is kind of atrocious. It's the opposite of SRE, if you want, because instead of having that team that takes the pager off the shoulders of the developers, we told the developers, here, we don't take the pager, you take the pager, right? You build it, you run it. Um, so why, could, why did they even like that? Like, all our developers should have quit and joined Google or something, right? Um, but they liked it, and this is, we embraced our culture. They were really keen on autonomous decision, doing their own thing, and guess what? If you carry your own pager, nobody will interfere with your mode of operations. Yes, you're carrying your own pager. You can do whatever you want. So autonomy for the win. Also, of course, you have to suffer the consequences. There's a very short feedback loop in that, um, which makes you do the right things, perhaps. Um, we call that boldly true DevOps. And um, there's a, ha, there it is. <clears throat> there's this famous one sentence definition, Ben Trainer defining SRE is what happens when you ask a software engineer to design an operations team. So now, of course, we have to do another quote, like Matthias and I, we did this in our book chapter. True DevOps, very humble, true DevOps is if there are no separate Dev and Ops teams anymore and not even designated Dev or Ops roles within a team. So, no, SRE is an operations team. We don't have operations team. And we have organized the whole company. I mean, that's not true. We have organized all of engineering behind these lines. Ironically, the non-engineering part has things like comops, or they still have the term ops, but in engineering, we don't have that anymore. Um, now, how is this even SRE? I should be at non-SRE con and give this talk, right? Um, but the interesting thing is, um, you can only make this work if you obey fundamental SRE's laws. And that's the interesting part, right? You do kind of implementation-wise a different idea, antithesis of it, but you still have to know and obey the laws to make it successful. Or even more strictly, if you have that small scale and a lot of features problem, I would claim the only way to apply SRE laws is to do true DevOps because you cannot have that dedicated SRE team. So it's still SRE in spirit. This is how I call it. Um, and there are all those uh, best practices of SRE, and they are totally valid in that situation. You have to automate operations as far as possible, because now you, you, ha you have to develop the product, and you still have to operate it, right? So it has to be automated. Your on-call rotations must be the right size for proper work-life balance. Your monitoring, monitoring must be meaningful. Your alerting. Your pages must be actionable, they have, must have run books. All those things, it applies. Like, even the 50% ops work rule is now even stricter. I mean, you have to develop the tools to do all this operation stuff, but you also have to develop the product in the first place. Um, so, SRE, it's, it's kind of, in a way, even purer than, than before. And this creates an effective self-regulation of features versus stability, and you might argue balancing your tech depth. Um, and this is, if you read the SRE book, a lot is about this. A lot is about you cannot just rule or mandate that engineers do this or that. You always need those like self-regulation feedback loops or something. Just in a larger organization, they are bigger, right? You have error budgets or to return the pager nuclear option or something. And we shortcut this loop. And of course, this doesn't work in a really large organization, but the scale of our organization was the reason in the first place why we couldn't do original SRE. So kind of we turned the problem into a virtue and um, 
made our way out of that. Now the question is, of course, um, error budgets, right? That's the example we started with. Do we, are we doing error budgets now? And the question is like, perhaps, <laughs> um, the, um, I mean, things have worked out by now quite nicely. Um, so we could, I think we could implement them by now because first we have proper monitoring, second we have that maturity in the company that people would probably now align behind that. Um, we still don't, we can't return the page, right? But um, <laughs> uh, we do something like soft error budgets. We have a site-wide reliability or availability target which can be calculated into a monthly error budget or something. And this is on all our big wall screens and we have proper monitoring. So we can tell people, okay, listen, we are not doing great this month. Our error budget is already half gone. Um, so we should perhaps be a bit more cautious launching new features, risky pushes or something. Um, that kind of works well enough. Like we have more urgent problems to tackle right now than implement strict error budget. That would be by servers and strictly enforced and all those things. We could, I guess, but um, yeah, I think we made this work by having those short feedback loops. Um, I also liked it when Niall Murphy had this polemic against on-call that many of the things you were talking about, they actually work quite nicely in our setup now. It's kind of tech that metaphor, the people who take out the loan are also the people who pay the interest, mostly. It's not completely true, but like 80%. And also, like all those things that you do to make on call almost go away, they all suddenly appear very attractive to the people who are actually in charge of doing this. All right, um, managing tech debt still quite challenging. Um, of course, tough market situation, but I think we have found a quite nice way matching our culture um, and matching our scale to deal with that. And with that, um, there is a um, GitHub repo where I link all my talks, so there will be slides linked, but you can also look up talks of a similar topic that are more like, tell more of the story, and of course you should read our book chapter and the whole book around it. But that's it, thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. There is probably time for one question. Hi, uh, so I'm interested, uh, uh, your SRE team, uh, what is it responsible for if the DevOps, what do you own uh, if, the, if the devs are doing the reliability part? Um, so you could kind of see that everything is organized along those um, kind of, it's, it's a vertical or horizontal thing, whatever, like developers own, running their own system, but what makes that possible in the modern world, because we have a CE, CI, CD pipeline, we have like Kubernetes, and developers can just like put things on Kubernetes, but then perhaps that's what you're fishing for. Who runs Kubernetes, right? But that's again, like we, we run Kubernetes, um, but again, we run it in, I mean, previously we had developed our own orchestration platform. Then we were a developer of the orchestration platforms, but we were also our own SREs and running that. While at Google, there are like Borg developers and Borg SREs. Um, we were same idea. That was actually how this all started because the infrastructure people did exactly that. They developed infrastructure software and were on call for it. And that was kind of spreading throughout the company. That's the history of it. And of course, we were developing a monitoring system, the one that we all know now, it's called Prometheus, and we were kind of on call for it, but nowadays even developers own their own Prometheus servers and try to fix it, but then we are the escalation point. So there's, there's a division, there's like an infrastructure stack that like infrastructure teams own, but they, even they run it in that idea of like true DevOps. And then developers, they own quite a lot of things. It works out in our situation. Sounds great. Thank you very much, Bjorn. Okay, thank you.